OK, the recording has started. Uh, be sure that your your chat is open and ready to go because that's a, a great way to ask questions today. What I'm going to do is um, hit mute all for attendees. If you need to ask a question or if you want to chime in, you could totally unmute. Uh, but we're just making sure that there isn't any ambient noise going on during the meeting. Um, welcome uh, to the review for our request for proposals and, of course, the application process for affordable materials grants. This is for round 22. Um, this can also apply to round 23, but I believe that if we will have a round 23, which depends on a confirmed budget, which is coming a little late this year, um, then we will probably run another meeting uh, just to make sure everybody is caught up. So first of all, I'd really like for you to share who you are. Um, share your institution, your department, or Aubrey, in your case, um, your, your company. Hi. <laughs> um, if it's your first time with ALG or if you're returning, and why are affordable resources or OER important to you? I'm also going to put one thing in chat real quick. This is a link to how to uh, find free and open resources. If you are not familiar with OER, um, this is not the presentation that goes over all the nuts and bolts of that. Uh, it's pretty cool, though. So we have a self-guided tutorial on our site that will guide you through all of that. And there's even one uh, for creating and modifying OER if you're into making some cool stuff and sharing it out with the world uh, for everyone to uh, reuse and revise and remix. Oh, Dr. Balin says from the University of West Georgia, uh, it's first time, uh, makes education affordable to Georgia citizens. Yes, absolutely. Um, Kendra from Georgia Southern University and the Department of Literature, uh, making education accessible. And that's that's a good point. When we talk about accessibility, we often talk about accessibility to those who uh, have different abilities. So um, people who are, aren't sighted or are not, uh, don't have uh, great hearing capabilities. But when it comes to access, it also has to do with cost. So for sure. Um, Aubrey with Lumen Learning, <laughs> welcome. I fly in well to hear about the process, of course. Uh, Yvonne Fuentes, uh, University of Georgia, English, Film Languages, and Performing Arts. Uh, important to reduce costs to students and increase engagement. Uh, Laura Gosa is here from Georgia Southwestern in nursing. Uh, we are learning about the process and decreasing costs to students. Uh, Peter Fielding, hello uh, from Kennesaw College of the Arts, interest in uh, OER to promote freely accessible materials. Um, Karen Sparrows, lecturer from UWG, first time here. Uh, we've got Dr. Holbrook from a uh, in biology at the uh, Nat Department of Natural Sciences, College of Coastal Georgia. Sticker shock at outrageous textbook prices. Oh yes, especially well, I wouldn't say especially in biology, but definitely in biology. Um, Dr. Garrido in computer science. Dr. Brown, Georgia Gwinnett College. Ah, from sponsored projects. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Um, at, if you're at Georgia Gwinnett College, the Office of Research and, and Sponsored Projects is super supportive of Affordable Learning Georgia and their grants. They're, uh, they're really there to help you out. Dr. Solis, uh, University of West Georgia International Language and Culture, first time for ALG, about decreasing, uh, probably decreasing costs here and capturing students' interest. Uh, Dr. Wiles, Augusta University Department of Biology, first time. Hello. Dr. Ionetta from Georgia Tech, uh, considering ways to bring down costs to students in writing courses. Excellent. You know, I should I should put my camera on. Here we go. Yeah, Teams puts my uh, camera all the way down in the bottom corner. So sometimes I don't even know if it's on or not. Dr. Dutta, uh, Assistant Director of Writing and Composition at Georgia Tech. First time. Hello. Up. Uh, yeah. Up. Uh, Dr. Connor, Associate Professor of Geography at George Gwinnett, returning to ALG. Yes, hello. Uh, keep introducing yourselves. I will keep going at this point uh, to make sure that we don't have a one hour meeting full of introductions and then you go, oh no, I have a, I have a class to be at. So I'm going to go through uh, transformation grants and continuous improvement grants and just talk about what they are. Um, this won't be a huge amount of details. That stuff is on the request for proposals. Uh, the request for proposals, along with all of that cool stuff. 
is over at the round 22 RFP page. The RFP itself is a Word document. It's got a whole bunch of things that um, your grants offices, your business offices might need to know, as well as you and the rest of the team, your sponsors. It answers a lot of questions as to what is uh, a letter of support, that type of thing. Um, stuff that we won't have the time to go through today. So transformation grants are the first ones that we ever got started in ALG back in 2014. The idea was there are a lot of expensive textbooks out there uh, that instructors are using as required materials. Uh, often students are not uh, purchasing those textbooks as a result. Um, they often have unequal access to materials as a result of that too. Uh, so, oh, I'm hitting mute all because we have an, I think an office chat that came in. Um, and also it, it's, it's especially because we are both looking at access from an accessibility standpoint and access from a cost standpoint in Georgia. If we want a more educated Georgia, that has to be for all Georgians. That can't just be for those who can afford stuff above the cost of college already um, for their learning materials. So transformation grants are all about replacing those very expensive materials with affordable materials. So they could be no cost, uh, especially open educational resources are great for this. They could be low cost. Um, they could be low cost homework solutions or a uh, low cost courseware in general. Anything that's below uh, $40 as the cost cap. And continuous improvement grants came out of that later. And we'll talk about continuous improvement grants after. Um, just suffice to say, they are not transformation grants. Transformation grants are about transforming the materials uh, in your course from expensive commercial to affordable. Now the funding structure for transformation grants, because this is a big heavy lift, this is changing a lot of things that you're doing, um, not only in the resources that you're using, but in how you're taking a look at the course, making sure that everything that you're bringing in is aligned to the outcomes that you want. There's a lot of course design behind the scenes, a lot of agreements um, between all of, all of the members of a team, sometimes all the members of a department, that's a lot of work. So it is a $5,000 maximum award for uh, per individual team member for salary, course release, travel, et cetera. Um, those things are considered direct expenses um, as opposed to indirect expenses, which are things like facilities and administration, which are not covered in uh, these grants because it is from the system office to uh, a USG institution. We're all part of the same organization in that way. Um, there are uh, additional project expenses that you can put in your application uh, up to a $30,000 maximum total award per grant, but they have to be very justified in the proposal budget um, that, they, that these additional expenses are necessary, and here's how they're going to work. Uh, we uh, don't just have uh, Affordable Learning Georgia themselves looking at it, but also peer reviewers who need to know um, when you're asking for a particular thing why it's being used. So you can uh, you can put these into the grants, but uh, as as I said, there are a lot of reviewers who are going to be looking at this. They all need to know why it's necessary. So if you have something in your budget and you're like by default, oh, well, of course we need this. Well, someone who's reading it uh, and doesn't know your department, your team, your course, they may not understand that. So you do have to make that clear if you're adding any expenses uh, above your usual materials, personnel, that kind of thing too. Uh, okay, so continuous improvement grants, they're the ones that are not transformation grants. Um, the reason why we now have continuous improvement grants is that, yes, it is amazing to do transformation work, and for uh, we think it's a great thing to support that work, but the initial work on a project like this sometimes isn't enough. Um, you may, about four years down the line, suddenly go, wait a minute, uh, we need a really big update for this open text that we wrote. Or uh, wouldn't it be amazing if we had an entire video collection, an open video collection, to support the OER that we're using in the class? Um, what if we had an entire set of narrated lecture slides um, and 
like practice questions for homework. That kind of stuff can take extra time. And that's what we're covering here is the extra time to keep your teaching with things like OER sustainable. Um, now, continuous improvement grants uh, do not support things that aren't going to be shared in some way. Uh, if you're improving proprietary stuff that won't result in us being able to share anything out and make everyone else's teaching more sustainable, that would be tough. But if you have existing OER um, that you're updating through uh, things like accuracy, you, you've, you're using someone else's OER and you realize that in 2022, this really needs a content update. You can totally do that. Um, doing an accessibility revision of existing OER, uh, really going in for clarity where things are just completely unclear, where the tone is off, that kind of thing. Um, your uh, different kinds of design, it could be instructional design, it could be uh, graphic design. That would be especially important if you have a, a course that's heavily dependent on images, uh, something like, for example, uh, anatomy and physiology, right? Everybody needs extensive diagrams and photos in that course. Um, compatibility. So let's say that you have a PDF and it's kind of locked down. There's not much you can do about it. And you want to do a revision that makes it readable to everyone, it uh, shareable in multiple formats. That's another thing that would take some extra work and would benefit everybody if you shared it out, right? So that's uh, the OER part. You can also create new stuff though. This isn't just for revisions of existing OER. So let's say you're creating a new video series, like I said uh, earlier. That's not revising previous OER, but that is adding value to your course. That's adding value to anyone who's adopted those resources before. Uh, that's adding value to the folks who are just now considering doing a project like this. Um, so, yeah, uh, the creation of new OER is part of this as well. And of course, if we mention ancillary materials, we're not just talking about, OK, I have lecture slides from before. We're just going to throw them out there and there's our project. Uh, it, they're materials that create that are created in the project to substantially support your instruction um, when you're already using these kinds of existing open educational resources. Now, the funding structure for these is smaller. They used to be called mini grants. Um, it's 2,000 maximum per team member, up to 10,000 maximum total award per grant. And like before, you can have up to that maximum additional projects expenses, but you really need to make sure you justify them in the total budget. Now, there are categories um, for priority when it comes to these projects, and it's just strategic priorities that Affordable Learning Georgia has. Oh, I have a question. Uh, from Dr. Shannon Baker. The continuous doesn't mean you have to have received a grant in the past, right? No. So if you're already teaching with OER and you want to create some cool new stuff, uh, you've been using something that's just kind of out of date, you want to make a new revision of it and we can uh, share it in our database with the entire world. Absolutely. A, a continuous improvement grant can be that for sure. We want to make sure we're supporting everybody who's teaching with affordable resources not just people who have already made the transformation uh, through a grant process. Oh, thank you, no problem. So these priority categories are things that th they do not disqualify you if you do not meet these. Um, they're not requirements. And I've, I've gotten emails before saying like, uh, you know, are we disqualified if it doesn't fit this department wide thing? And I'm like, that, that, that has nothing to do with qualifications. Um, this only gives you a couple of extra points if you're helping out with the strategic priorities of ALG, stuff that hasn't been covered that much within our system. Uh, Dr. Wilson says we're considering a text that is $39.99, including homework. 90% uh, of students will uh, buy using the link. 10% of the students will buy from the bookstore, which marks it up 10. So when it comes to the low cost designation on these resources, um, you know, especially if you're going to be marking it in the catalog as low cost, as, as 40, you're going to have to make sure that it works with the bookstore because financial aid um, winds up not working out with uh, things that are not uh, going through the bookstore. And often when we're talking about uh, cost and equity, we want to make sure that 
that everyone is, who has financial aid and depends on it to purchase even affordable resources can do so. Um, the first thing that I'd recommend that you do is get in contact with the bookstore about this. Um, it is possible that they can look into different options uh, in, in doing this. It, it's it's going to be tough. I think it, it's tough when, when you have bookstore markup included, but really what you should be considering the cost is the cost to a student who would have to purchase things through uh, financial aid. Yeah, that's a tough one. That's that is a uh, it's a hairy question for sure. Um, so uh, the, our first priority is collaborative projects with professional support. We found that if you include um, support people on your team who aren't just the instructors, things go even better. And because of that, we really want to see some high quality proposals happen um, that are in collaboration with professional staff. That can include instructional designers. They are often the go to people for accessibility. Uh, often they are the ones that are really good for outcomes. I know at Augusta University, there is a teaching and learning uh, department there that helps folks create like open games and open media. It's really neat. It depends on your institution. Some places do not have instructional designers um, or only have maybe one who helps out with online stuff. That is OK. Again, this is just a priority category. It is not something that would disqualify you. The most important thing is having a great proposal. Um, librarians can also help out too. If you want to do a really big survey of the landscape of resources that are out there and you want to bring them all together in one place and stay up to date with it, having a librarian on your team can help so much. Um, if you are doing an upper level course, and you can't find a lot of open textbooks out there for upper level courses um, and including your own um, librarians can often help out in bringing library resources together that cover um, those upper level courses. Often uh, that's where the good stuff is for something that's highly specialized. Um, instructional technologists, so people to help out with instructional tech and uh, creating new stuff. Um, there are a couple of folks who have helped uh, in the creation of some of our most popular open textbooks, and they've been able to bring them over into EPUB formats, bring them over into the Kindle uh, format. And uh, when they have something that they'd like to do with it that's interactive, they're they're there. They're able to immediately, uh, you know, bring out their bag of tricks and, and just suddenly it, it works. It's really cool. Um, web designers, same thing. Programmers, if, especially if you're doing something that requires like hard coded stuff. Uh, graphic designers uh, also. Uh, Sarah says there was 800 for software or et cetera. Now it is. OK, so uh, Sarah, there's a, there were two different things um, with the continuous improvement budget. Um, we made it a lot more flexible this way. So it is 2000 per team member and then up to the um, the $10,000 limit for a project. You can include other expenses in there, other project expenses. They have to be very clear because this is something that's uh, a bit out of the norm, but this is a, a way to make things a little bit more extensible than before. The old maximum used to be $4,800. Um, covering a maximum uh, amount of money for two team members or more distributed across team. This allows for bigger teams. This also allows for additional project expenses, but it's going to depend on the project. You just need to make sure that it's uh, that is clear to the peer reviewers. Thank you. Um, student participation in materials creation. I don't have to explain too many things here, but if you have students involved in things like uh, creation of uh, new open resources, uh, remixing things, making sure, of course, that you have their permission if, if you're sharing it out with the world, um, editing resources, uh, often that's a really cool assignment to do, uh, evaluating resources in, a, in an in-depth way. Um, that's a way to involve students in the learning process in a way that isn't always uh, set in stone when you have resources that are inflexible, that do not have any uh, permissions given to you, right? Um, 
if you'd have students as active participants, it would meet this priority category. Now, if you're just giving a survey to students at the end of your project, that is more quantitative and qualitative research on your end. Uh, students really do need to have a level of involvement in the project in order for this uh, to work out. Sometimes that means uh, a graduate assistant or a student assistant. Um, Dr. Fonte says, if we plan to include students to record videos and audio for activities and exams, but not sure we are 100% able, what do you suggest? So, what you would want to do, and this is usually how it works with students, because whether or not a particular student is there or not is going to depend on the semester, it's going to depend on their lives. Um, you would, in, in a generic way, say, uh, okay, a student assistant, this much, right? We are not awarding all of the funds immediately. It's 50% at the beginning, 50% at the end. Um, that's detailed in the funding section of the RFP, but we'll get to it a little bit later too. Um, if something doesn't happen, uh, you can still send back those funds that you did not use. So if, uh, if things go wrong, uh, or if you have a change in personnel, we brought on an instructor because we weren't able to uh, bring on that student. That's okay. These these kinds of things happen. Uh, so I would say when you're going to bring a student on, be generic about the role. Say you know a grad student, a student assistant, something like that, because things change so quickly. Um, and plus, if you want um, a student assist assistant or a grad student for multiple semesters. You might not know if you're able to have multiple people in that role on each semester or one in there. That would be a little bit different from the usual 2000 per team member maximum. You would say it's this much for a grad student for this semester, this much for a grad student for this semester. Uh, I, I would rather you not have names there because things change so wildly and we're flexible enough with this plan. Um, Dr. Ionetta says we're considering going OER, um, which would be free, text cost 4369. The shift rep uh, represents a mark cut to the student cost. But does this exclude us from the grant program? Uh, OK, so um, the adoption of low cost materials is supposed to not exceed uh, $40 total per student. Uh, so that's part of the whole transformation thing. It turns into the uh, the kind of definition of low cost that we have for the banner designators. Um, so I would check in on that and see if you have uh, um, other resources to consider and also send me an email because sometimes uh, folks have something that they think is just one package, but really it's like an entire text and a lab manual. If you're addressing a lab and you're addressing a textbook, those can be two different projects. It is too much of an undertaking for us to say, OK, well, you've got uh, a biology course. You're going to be replacing X biology text over here, and then you're going to be creating a new lab manual to work with the stuff that you're going to do. That is too much for a project like this. So if you have a lab, that is a different story. So I uh, know if it's a book for a two sequence writing course. Yeah, so that's a tough one. Uh, send me an email and we'll work out the details there. Uh, we'll have to make it clear to folks who are reading it um, exactly what this impact means uh, and you know how many students are going in from that sequence. There could be a little bit of an exception there given uh, the amounts that it's over. Yeah, just yeah, send me an email and we can we can work on that. Cool. Thank you all for the questions, by the way. I I really like it when there are questions. If there are no questions, I get worried. Uh, OK, so the other one is departmental scaling projects. Uh, so one of the big things that uh, folks above Affordable Learning Georgia looking at it said were, well, what if an entire department went all in and said, we are going to be all OER for this course? That's really cool, um, but it is also a huge undertaking. Uh, sometimes there's buy-in uh, that you would have to gather. Uh, sometimes there's uh, agreement on particular resources, agreements on outcomes uh, through that throughout the entire department, uh, agreements on methodologies. 
I've talked to the psychology folks and uh, you know, some people approach introduction to general psych from a behavioral standpoint. Others approach it from an experimental standpoint. Um, there are many different ways that it's taught and that can be different in the department too. Uh, so it can be a huge undertaking to do this, but if you do, uh, and you've got a project uh, proposed and everyone's committed to it, uh, then yeah, you would uh, have some extra priority points there too. Now there needs to be a commitment from the department to at least pilot the project. Uh, there was in the past uh, a plan where they said where they thought that they had the department on board, but they didn't really have confirmation of it. And then later on, two or three people were like, no, we're not actually going to do this. So of course, then the impacts changes, uh, the plan changes. You don't have as many people able to help out. So be sure uh, in the letter of support that you have confirmation that the department is going to do this uh, when you're a departmental scaling project for sure. And then upper level campus collaborations. Uh, as I mentioned before, upper level courses have a tougher time um, finding great OER. It's often because you're making the biggest splash by creating um, an introductory course set of materials. Now there are a lot out there, which is great, and people are starting to address other courses. But often when you've got like uh, external grant funding, government funding, uh, nonprofit funding, they often want to look at the amount of students that you're supporting, as we do, uh, and make sure that you're making a, a big enough impact. So because of that, uh, we are asking upper level course folks to work together um, at different institutions because you might be teaching just a, uh, two courses, 20 students uh, per section, and it's not uh, going to affect that many, but doing a transformation would be a huge undertaking. Well, if you work on that as a team with another institution that is also teaching about that much, you're now doubling the impact and you've got uh, extra people on your team. So when it comes to upper level stuff, uh, yeah, be sure to reach out to folks at other institutions to collaborate. And I'm not saying that if you have an upper level course and you do not collaborate across the institution that you're disqualified, you are not. If you have a great proposal and it has impact, it's great. Um, but if you have, uh, if you are collaborating across institutions, you'll get a couple of extra points as meeting a strategic priority. So how does funding work? Uh, funding goes to the institution. The agreement is between the system office and the institution that this project is going to happen. The institution with that funding then covers the team members' time, uh, include, uh, includes stuff like uh, travel expenses if we have them, the future is uncertain, um, related departmental needs, uh, materials, that kind of thing. Uh, and of course, this works within institutional policies too. Uh, so the USG has their policies, but the institution also has them when it comes to spending funds. Uh, you would definitely want to talk to your grants office or business office about this. Um, and the funding, as I said before, is 50% on the execution of the SLA, which is the signatures both at your institution and over here at, um, at the USG and then 50% on the final report. So institutions differ on this for sure. Uh, budgets are supported by state funds. We have to follow, of course, state laws, state rules and regulations. Um, institutions do all that as well. Um, the USG and the Board of Regents, they have policies that all institutions do follow. And then institutions have their own policies. Um, so usually when there is an institutional policy, that one wins out. So you want to make sure that you know your institution's policies on this stuff. Uh, as I've learned uh, since 2014, these differ quite a bit. Um, they don't usually include the more extensive guidelines that you would have to bring in for federal grants um, or for NGO grants. Uh, it, that kind of stuff uh, has a lot more uh, USG policies on it, but those do not apply when it's an agreement between the system office and the institution. Your institution may still treat it that way. 
and it is on them to make that decision. So it is possible that you may be following federal policies, even though it's an agreement between the system office and the institution. You'll definitely have to make sure uh, with your institution that everything is going to work that way. Now, these grants do not include indirect expenses, and this can be very confusing uh, for folks. Direct expenses fund the project. So that means uh, salary, that can mean overload pay, summer pay, that can mean a course release, um, anything that goes towards your time. But if there's any salary being paid to you through the institution, through our agreement, that will include the fringes as well. So things like healthcare and taxes, that stuff still gets um, still gets treated the same way that your regular pay gets treated. Um, that is not considered indirect expenses. That is covering your time because those fringes have to be included in covering your time. The good thing is that income all goes through the institution and payroll, so you're not having to do a 1099 later on on uh, supplemental income. Uh, then uh, project supplies and software would go through their purchasing. That is also a direct expense. Indirect expenses are very specific, and if you've ever been on a federal grant, an NSF grant, NIH, that kind of thing, you are usually in the proposal uh, charging the funders some percentage for facilities and administration. Um, you are doing somebody else's project. They are not part of your system. They're not part of your institution. Therefore, they pay a little bit extra to keep the lights on as you do it. Um, that's the most common stuff for indirect expenses. That's not an agreement between the system office and an institution. So if we see facilities and administration, F&A, that kind of thing, we're like, uh oh, and then we reach out to you and make sure that you can uh, not do this indirect expense thing. That's one big way that we are not part of the federal grants. But if you see, uh, the way that the business office structures this and says, here's how much you're paid, here's all the fringes that are included in that. Do not be surprised that fringes are included. That is part of the direct expenses. So here is the timeline for applying. Uh, Monday, October 31st, Halloween at midnight. Uh, it's kind of a weird deadline, but it's usually just uh, that Monday that's right before November, and it just so happens to be Halloween. Um, that is the application deadline. Uh, I say Monday at midnight. I do not mean 12 a.m. meaning the uh, beginning of the day. I mean the end of the day. I often say end of day because of that too. But end of day has its own thing where it's like, well, what if the sun goes down? No, no, no. The end of Monday, right before it becomes Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday, November 1st is when peer reviews start. Uh, early in that morning, yes, 11.59 p.m. You can do it all. Uh, but then early in the morning on Tuesday, I take an inventory of all of the uh, proposals that we have, and I am sending them out to peer reviewers who will also be selected for this. They cannot be applying for a project uh, at the same time, and reviewers who are reviewing your proposal are not from your institution either. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, 11.59 and 59 seconds and uh, yeah. 59 nanoseconds. Um, November 16th through the 21st are administrative reviews. That is usually, well, uh, Tiffany was with us until July 1st. Uh, she is off on new endeavors and has a daughter. It's really cool. Her, her name is Sophia. Um, but yeah, uh, it'll be mostly me, and then I will be working with our executive director, Lucy, to make sure that um, the projects that are approved are meeting all of our guidelines that the impact's calculated correctly. I mean, if you have 20 students and a, a $200 textbook you're replacing, you're probably not saving $400,000 a year. And I have to make sure that all of that is very uh, bundled up uh, before we get started because I use that stuff for tracking and data later on. Um, notifications will be sent out on Tuesday, November 22nd, right before break, I know. Um, but we needed a, a good time to send it out uh, right before uh, all of that happens. Uh, mm -hmm. Friday, December 9th is the online kickoff. We've blocked off 1 to 4 p.m. 
Sometimes it goes exactly that long. There are a lot of interesting in-depth questions and discussions that might happen, um, but also it could end early. We never really know. Um, this is the online portion of it. There's also an asynchronous portion where you're you're doing a little bit of training on what are open educational resources, um, what is this program, what are our grants, how do they work, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page. The online part of it that's synchronous for us, this kickoff on December 9th, that's for us to all get to know each other and for me to talk about the service level agreement process, the SLA process, um, the contract. Uh, just to make sure that you're all ready for the paperwork that's about to happen. Um, the paperwork is not that much, but it is very important. So yeah, uh, for transformation grants, at least one team member needs to be there. It's required. Um, and if you have a lot more people on the team, I would suggest having as many as possible there. Uh, especially like if you think you're going to take care of all of the administrative stuff as the project lead, and then something happens, someone else is going to have to help out with that. So if you've got at least one backup, that's great. But transformation grants are flexible, extensible, it, it depends. Now, if you were at the, uh, no travel involved, yes. We used to meet in Macon, um, then COVID-19 happened, and now we meet online, and we have found no reason to bring everybody all the way back to uh, Macon to do that again. I don't know, maybe in the future sometime if things are cool, but mm, yeah, not right now. Oops. Okay. And continuous improvement grants. Uh, it is optional to participate in the meeting, but it's recommended. You have to still participate in the asynchronous training, um, and you still have to be up on how to do a service level agreement. Now, if you were, uh, if you were in one of our last rounds last year, and you went through this process. You don't have to then attend the kickoff meeting again. Uh, it will be a review for you. If you would like to be there, that's fine. Uh, but just let me know if you uh, want to be exempt from that because you've attended in like the last round or something like that. That's OK. So we're about to run through how to apply for the grades. Before that happens, do we have any more questions? I'm going to keep my awkward silence short today, but I am an instructor of sorts, so I do like giving awkward silence to see if we can bring everything up. Ah, yep, here we go. Uh, Dr. Holbrook, are an individual faculty allowed to be team members on two separate projects being proposed in the same round? Yes. Um, often you'll have someone who is just an anchor person, a complete OER champion at your institution who uh, helps out with so many different uh, teams. That is totally OK. Uh, it, it depends on uh, you know, your ability to do so for sure. Are we going to talk about the length of the grant? Uh, so all of these end in fall 2023. Uh, so that is uh, unless you are a continuous improvement grant, in which case you can select to end in summer 2023 if you want to. All transformation grants end fall 2023. And it says that on the applications themselves. So what I'm going to do is quickly tell you about how to apply. Um, you make sure that you bookmark the uh, grants page for the RFP. I'm going to put it in chat right now. This is the main grants page uh, for round 22. Um, and I've got a link to the grants page itself, the, the big ALG grants page that has all the rounds. But this is the uh, particular one. Can we receive the presented material? Yeah, I'm going to be sending the slides out to all of the attendees and registrants for sure. And it'll be on the round 22 page that I just linked. So good time. Um, complete the uh, Word document first. That is the Word application form for your grant. So don't fill out a continuous improvement grant if you are doing transformation work and the other way around. We even have a little uh, branching path thing called which should I apply for? Uh, and if you answer some questions on there, it should help you get to that point. Dr. Weil says our funds for salary applied in addition to, uh, to normal faculty salary or faculty required to take course release. This will depend on your department and your institution. Course releases are great if you're able to take the time to do so. 
Uh, some institutions will say, okay, you are 12 month faculty and uh, it, because we can't pay you over the summer to do this work because you are doing regular stuff over the summer, uh, the course release is the best way to do it. Sometimes it's overload. Some institutions don't do overload at all. So be sure to talk to your business or grants office about that. Um, it is very different per institution. So be sure uh, before you apply that you've talked to the uh, grants or business office about that. And I say grants or business office because some institutions are pretty small. They don't have a grants office themselves. They have a business office that does all of those operations. Um, one thing that is different here that I forgot to change is that this is not an Alchemer form anymore. If you have an old link to the uh, the online application, it's not going to work. This is a new form uh, to apply, so be sure to use the Round 22 web page uh, that has all of the new stuff on there. And let's see. Am I about to walk through it? Yes, I am. OK, so I'm going to share my screen really quickly. Here we go. Hey, look at that. It's my schedule. Um, I'm going to first bring up the Word document for the transformation grants. And I'm going to zoom in because this is way too small. Um, let's go to 200%. Perfect. OK. So some of this will direct you to the RFP. Be sure to check out the RFP. If uh, your business office has questions about how this all works, it's on the RFP. Um, and then the italic text, this is just meant for clarifications. You can get rid of it uh, as needed, or I would recommend getting rid of it if it's in one of the cells itself. Um, it tells you about the kickoff, then it's the team information. So the applicant is whoever it is that's going to be the project lead. Um, or whoever is submitting the application on behalf of the team itself, who's going to be in the team, your name, your email, position, and title. Um, submitter, same thing. Now, a submitter can be the same person. If you're submitting this and you are going to be the project lead, you don't have to fill out an additional submitter thing because you're the same person. There are places where grants offices, or even provosts have submitted uh, all of the applications at once on behalf of the teams. In that case, we're going to have to have a submitter name, email, and position, and title. Just in case there's like a weird glitch or something like that with a submission and not with the application, we want to make sure that we're asking the right people. Um, team members here, name and email address. This is for contact. Uh, we want to make sure that we can email absolutely everybody um, when we're coordinating things like the kickoff meeting. Uh, so make sure that you are mentioning every team member with their name and their email address. If you put like doctor, PhD, Mrs. Uh, or Ms. etc., um, that kind of stuff can mess up alphabetization. Uh, so I would really hold off on that. Just give names. Um, any more team members to add than six, you can add them down here. Um, priority category. So if you meet one of the priority categories, you would type it in here. Otherwise, just put none. Um, requested total amount of funding. So this is a transformation grant. So this is the 30,000 maximum total award per grant. This is the total amount of funding you're asking. The final semester of the project, this should be fall 2023. Um, on the continuous improvement grant one, you have a choice here. It's going to be fall 2023. If you're using an OpenStax textbook, if you already know that you're going to use it, um, then put yes or no here. Uh, that can help out because then OpenStax, we can tell them, hey, they're they're going to be using an OpenStax text. Um, and at that point, they can reach out, get you an instructor account and things like that to help. Um, here's the impact data. This part is tough to fill out, but be sure to be uh, thorough on this. So this is for each course. You don't have to do each section. If you have multiple sections of a course with different instructors, uh, you don't have to go one entire course per instructor, just courses. So, you know, you might be doing algebra on one and trigonometry on the other, but you won't want to do algebra with this person, algebra with this person, algebra with this person. Let's do the course title and number, the course instructors that are doing this, the number of students enrolled in the course per year. 
the average number of effect enrollments in summer, fall and spring. So this breaks it out into semesters. So let's say that you got started in fall. We're not taking the calendar year uh, as a whole in 2023 and saying that and assuming that you were teaching it in spring. We want to make sure that we have semester by semester results here. Um, original required commercial materials. So this is the title, author, price. What are you replacing? Uh, the original cost per student section enrollment. So um, this is the cost of all required materials that you've listed over here in number five. The average post project cost per student section enrollment. That means after this project is done, how much will the student have to pay for resources? Uh, for some of you, it might be $39.99. For a lot of you, it might be zero. Um, average post project savings per student section enrollment. Uh, so this one is how much you're saving. So let's say that the original costs $250, and you have a post project cost of $10. The post project savings are going to be $240 because they're still paying 10, but they're not paying 250. Um, sometimes these will be the same. Uh, the post project costs and the post project savings are the same because, uh, hey, they or the cost per student section enrollment originally six and eight would be the same uh, because you'd be doing minus zero. Uh, but it depends on the project. If you have a low cost thing, this will differ. If you don't, it'll be the same thing. And then you're multiplying the post project savings per student by the annual number of students enrolled in the course per year to get your total impact for that course. This seems a little bit overwhelming at first, but when you see our reports and how we say, okay, we've saved this amount of students, this and estimated this many dollars um, in this many years, that's what we're looking at. The number of students, the number of savings per student as a multiplier. Now these averages, you don't want to give a range. If it's something like 210 to 260, uh, give an average cost for all of the different sections that you're addressing. Um, if we go too deep into this, we won't be able to do any calculations. It'll just be this big branching path and we're just going to not be able to do anything about it. Uh, we work with averages on that. So you do that. We have plenty of space for courses here. Um, if you have more than four of them that you're addressing, you just copy this whole table, paste it in. Uh, we even say that right here. Uh, the project goal. So not just we are going to save students money, but uh, what are you looking to achieve? Uh, if you're increasing access for students, is it because you want to increase their success, their retention? Uh, you want to transform pedagogy. This is the cool place to put that stuff. The statement of transformation, uh, be sure to cover what the course is like, um, what your, what's up at your institution. How's your department doing? Um, are, are your students in a particular situation that's unique and this is why it needs to happen? Uh, describe your project overall and how it's going to impact it. The action plan is where we get into the details of how this project's going to work. So hopefully you have done a survey of the stuff that's out there to replace particular resources. Uh, this is important. This will make you stand out a little bit more if you've already done this review and said we're going to adopt this and we're going to make this because nothing exists out there. And if you say that the first thing that you're going to do is start looking at resources, that doesn't disqualify you, but it doesn't look as good as doing all of that beforehand. Uh, so just be sure that all of this is covered. Same with quantitative and qualitative measures. There are some baseline things, um, you know, student satisfaction overall. That's usually measured through a survey question or two. Student performance overall, that's usually grades, uh, but sometimes if you do a standardized learning outcomes test, you might do it that way. Uh, and course level retention, that's usually DFW or drop fail withdrawal rates. At some institutions, it is grade D, grade F withdrawal rates. Uh, University of Georgia has done that for a while. That's okay. Uh, but if you're going anywhere beyond that to get more insights into the project, include how you're going to do that too. If you need IRB, indicate that here. If you need IRB approval, um, just especially for yourself to know, I have to go out and do this as part of the project. 
your timeline. Uh, this is going to be exactly how the major milestones happen. Uh, you know, we, we've created this by this point. Uh, we have this meeting with our department at this point, that kind of thing, events, uh, deadlines, and then make sure that this illustrates how your action plan is going to get done. The budget is uh, where all of the costs are for this project. Um, we have the maximum here. Uh, be sure to, uh, you don't have to put in the cost of the fringes if you don't have it. Uh, that can get pretty confusing. In the past, some peer reviewers have gone like, well, this person has a bunch of details and this one doesn't. And I would say, that's okay. That is for them to work out with your institution. That's not a big deal uh, if you have just the amount per team member in here. Um, your additional projects expenses, be sure that you're covering in your plan how these are going to be used. The sustainability plan. So yes, continuous improvement grants can cover some big substantial extra work, but be sure that you have a plan to keep this going semester by semester. Um, you will in the online application, agree to the Creative Commons terms, the accessibility terms. Uh, you'll have a letter of support from your sponsor, from the department chair. If you are the department chair, it's somebody above. It's not you as the project lead cannot write the letter of support. Um, so you just indicate who that is here and your grants or business office. There's a little acknowledgement form that is linked on the round 22 site um, that you'll have to get signed by them to say that you talked. Um, that's just to make sure that you're able to work out all of the service level agreement stuff and the payment stuff once it comes up. Continuous improvement grants are not that different. Um, they do not have the stuff for impact data because it is not a requirement um, on books. Zoom this into 200%. A lot of this is the same. You can select, you can select summer or fall. Um, you're going to indicate what it is you're going to be making here as opposed to replacing things. But then we have goals, action plan, timeline, budget, same stuff. Creative Commons terms, right. Letter of support, same thing. Uh, grants or business office acknowledgement form, exact same thing. So the continuous improvement grant application is just like the other one you just saw, but a little bit less because you're not um, you're not calculating things like the original cost, the number of students, et cetera. Uh, you are making improvements. Your deliverable is that stuff and the report um, on how it all went. So a little bit less stuff to do. Now, on the RFP page, after you're done with all that, then you do the big thing at the end. You click the online application link. The first thing that I'll ask is a transformation grant or a continuous improvement grant. That allows us to ask you uh, the questions that you need. Uh, we use a lot of skip logic. Here. So then I'm going to say, OK, sure. 30,000 transformation grant. Cool. Next. Name, institution, position, title, employee. I'm going to do test for all of these. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Employee ID number is a new one. And this is because you might have your name right now, but you may not have the same name in three years. And if we're going in to see if you're still uh, teaching with low cost materials in the data that gets shared by the USG to everybody, you know, like, Here's all the course sections. Here's um, exactly uh, how many students are enrolled, that kind of thing. The research and policy analysis folks um, are able to match that up uh, later on. So if you ever have a name change, um, that doesn't affect it. Now that's research and policy analysis stuff. We're not publishing the employee ID anywhere. We're using the Word document, which doesn't ask you for an employee ID as the thing that's on the service level agreement and the thing that's the proposal that will share out with the world. This does not get shared. This stays internal. Um, applicant email uh, is the applicant, uh, the same person submitting the application. So here, including the applicant, how many people are in the grant projects team? So this includes yourself. Um, so how many team members do you have? You put, okay, I have six. It's gonna ask you for five other team members, right? Name, email, and employee ID. And same thing here. Um, this stuff, of course, is mandatory. Uh, but we want to make sure 
that we can uh, find out if things are still going well in two or three years using our data. So I'm just going to put all this in. Why did I put five? My goodness, now I have to do all of this. Here we go. All right, next. Oh, enter a valid email address. OK. There we go. Or test.com over here is going to the some email addresses in here. There we go. I'm going to have to fix this. Yep. I will have to fix something here. Absolutely. It is giving me an email address form. All right. This is going to be an employee ID number with an open spot. Yes. All these email addresses. There we go. Now in here, uh, you put the course number. So I'll say uh, in kinesiology 1001. Or say the kinesiology. Students per summer. Uh, we teach 50 of them per summer. 300 per fall, 400 per spring. Total students per year is, uh, I don't remember what I just typed in, so hopefully that's correct. Uh, savings per student, $240. I am not making a multiplier at the moment. There we go. Uh, I'm going to hit next, but that's what you have to put in there. This really helps us with the tracking. Um, are you planning on creating any? Uh, yes, I am. Are you planning on remixing it? Uh, yeah, sure. Open stats. Kinesiology, I don't even think they have one, but I'm just going to put that in. Yep, OK, I meet that priority category. Then you upload the Word document, your letter of support, and your business at Grants Office Acknowledgement. Then you hit Next. After that, uh, you're going to get an email address with a copy of your application. Uh, we'll get your application over here, and you are all done. So that is the entire form. Um, Demoing it is weird, and sometimes I find out bugs that way. So don't apply today. I'm going to fix something up there today. Uh, but after that, it will be good. And here I am filming ourselves. This is Inception. Hello, everybody. Uh, I am going to then stop sharing my screen, share back out this meeting. Yes, you get some very nice time. Here we go. Pardon the quick scrolling. So a uh, couple of little things. There are rubrics on the site on exactly how everything is evaluated. Uh, the student savings impact and the planning are super important in transformation grants, along with quantitative and qualitative measures, teaching and learning impact. And then there's a little bit for clarity and alignment. Make sure that everything is written very clearly, that you're avoiding things like typos that especially might confuse folks. Uh, make sure that if you have a budget, it meets the action plan. Uh, there's nobody uh, in your budget who isn't in your plan. That would be kind of weird. Uh, that type of stuff. Same thing with continuous improvement grants. There's only one peer reviewer per continuous improvement grant. Um, the organization and the planning is the biggest thing. Teaching and learning impact also weighted very well. Clarity and alignment has a weighting of one. So the scores are more. Uh, when it comes to your organization, your planning, basically, uh, and these are any of these rubric categories are higher than the amount that you would have to meet a priority. So just be sure that you are uh, creating a well organized, well planned, feasible plan first and foremost that has some impact. That's what these rubrics are, especially all about. So I am going to uh, look at the chat first because there were some chats that came in while I was sharing the screen and the chat wasn't visible. Um, could, yeah, OK, so went through that. Our funds for salary, salary applies in addition to normal. Effect. OK, I already addressed that part. Uh, Dr. Wilson says if the textbook will be used in the second semester of a sequence, how do we represent the cost savings? So this is going to be a kind of a special case. And because of that, I really would like you to email me the details so that we can uh, make sure that that's clear on the application. Um, often what happens is you're demonstrating that most students pass through from the first to the second, but you may need to cover, because you're covering two courses, you may need to cover like what happens if a student does not go past that first course. Um, then course material uh, prices vary based on where students purchase. Yes, you should be using bookstore prices 
And that is primarily because of financial aid, as talked about when we uh, we're talking about the markup thing a little bit earlier. And again, if, it, if there's a markup question, be sure to contact your bookstore about it. Uh, and oh, I've gotten 11 o'clock, but thank you. Yes, thank you for being here. And yes, be in touch for sure. OK, so I'm going to say thank you for now for for showing your interest, for offering your expertise. Um, if you have any questions, send them right over to me. I, I love helping people out with this. I would much rather help you out than not see an application for sure. I want to see as many good applications as possible. And if you don't make it this round for some odd reason, uh, we want you to revise and resubmit it and have a cool project the next time around too. But we want as much of this as possible happen. We do not want to be uh, someone who's just slamming the door shut on folks for sure. So contact me with any questions you have. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording now. Thank you all for being here. And if you are viewing this online, send me an email if uh, if I missed any. Thanks so much. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, you as well.